you for watching our Zoom discussion about COVID-19 related data, what it means, how you can and should interpret the data. I'm Dr. Kara Odom Walker, Cabinet Secretary for the Delaware Department of Health and Social Services. I believe in data and its ability to help us make policy decisions, better decisions. As a practicing family physician, I often use data to help care for my patients. Science and data are complementary and powerful tools, and we're aggressively using data to understand this virus, which, as you know, has been on the world's radar screen for less than five months. Today, to help further our understanding, I am joined by Dr. Tabitha Offit Powell, the Chief of Epidemiology and Health Data and Informatics Group, Delaware State Epidemiologist in our Division of Public Health, and Dr. Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean of the Public Health Practice and Community Engagement at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Sharfstein is joining us as former Secretary of Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and Principal Deputy Commissioner of the US FDA. He's also a former Health Commissioner of Baltimore, and I so appreciate having you on today. I also want to acknowledge our ASL interpreter, Pamela Dokio, who is joining us. Thank you so much. First, let me set the data landscape in Delaware. As of Tuesday, we had 5,371 positive cases in our state, and unfortunately, 187 Delawareans who have died of COVID-19. Of that total, 121 deaths are associated with long-term care facilities. In a few minutes, Tabitha will show us how those numbers uh, show the rates of some of those metrics by race, ethnicity, and the disproportionate impact we are seeing in communities of color. In Delaware, we also have 284 people hospitalized. While that number has been relatively flat, the number of new hospitalizations, as Governor Carney mentioned last Tuesday, this Tuesday, is trending down. Unfortunately, of the 284 people who are hospitalized, 61 are in critical condition. We also have a total of 19,309 cases that have been negative. That gives us a percent positive of 21.8%, or about one in five of those who have been tested. The percentage of people who have tested is also trending down, another positive sign, and so is the five-day average of new positive cases. One thing we need to be aware of is that as we live in a state with a small population, it makes analyzing our data a bit more of a challenge because of the outsized impact that changes in individual data can have. So we continue to look at how best to display our data and share information about trends. One more positive Delaware data point. As of Tuesday, 1,847 Delawareans have recovered from COVID-19. So before we dive further into this data, I wanna make an important point. COVID-19 is a dangerous and very infectious disease. Anyone who is positive can transmit it to two to three more people, sometimes when they don't even know they have the virus. One of the reasons that our numbers are declining is because of the effectiveness of the governor's stay-at-home order and the fact that we've embraced social distancing, face coverings, and good hand hygiene. But we cannot let up despite the nice weather and decline in our numbers. If we do, we are likely to see new hotspots of infection or even worse, a second wave. And that's why it's so important that we look to the data experts, that we follow the science, and we follow the course of this virus. With that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Josh Sharstein Josh for a few uh, opening comments. Dr. Sharstein. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Walker, and thanks so much for having me. I think uh, what you all have done in Delaware is extremely important and does demonstrate exactly, like you said, that when there is uh, clear attention to the facts about this virus and a clear response plan, and people um, understand it and are able to follow it, then we are able to limit the horrible impact of death and disease. Um, right now, uh, there are 1.2 million confirmed cases of coronavirus in the United States with uh, 71,000 deaths, which is a tremendous uh, number of deaths and is probably an undercount uh, because as we know that um, not everybody who has died recently was able to get a coronavirus test. So um, we know that uh, there are certainly more. Um, a very important question is what is going to happen? 
Um, and related to that, how long will these um, conditions and restrictions last? And those two questions are linked. So if you ask what is going to happen, there are a number of models that have tried to assess uh, that question. And if you're following the models, your neck may hurt from going back and forth on what they're predicting. Um, certain models have adjusted their predictions quite a lot. And recently, in a not so good direction. Uh, previously, some models had suggested oh, only 60,000 deaths in the United States, but we're already at 71 after just a few months. And so now those models are predicting more like 120,000 deaths. So what is actually happening? I think um, the models themselves have to make certain assumptions about whether people will continue to be successful in following public health guidance. Like you said, if they are successful in doing so in Delaware, you can expect a stable or slowly declining rate of infection and death. Um, on the other hand, we know that there are states that are opening up um, in advance of uh, the kind of conditions that have been recommended, and there is a risk there as a result that cases will surge, that there could be additional outbreaks. and. For that to happen, then the numbers of cases will go up. What is really restricting the virus right now is our ability to prevent it from jumping to per from person to person. If we can keep doing that through distancing, the numbers will be less. But if we can't, the numbers will be more. So the problem isn't so much in the models, it's in the uncertainty about how we all will be able to uh, follow the guidance. Um, let me just turn to the next question, which is how long will we have these restrictions? That's another question that because this virus is so new, we don't know for sure. That will in part depend on whether we can truly reduce the number of infections it, um, by, uh, by doing the kinds of things that you said. It will also depend on our success in identifying medicines and vaccines. And so far, um, we have not found a highly effective medicine or a vaccine, but it is early. I think there is uh, every reason to be hopeful that um, we will start to find some more effective medicines even this summer, and that we will have a very good idea of promising vaccines in the fall. Um, what that means is if we can continue to, um, to follow critical public health guidance, we are giving time for the science to come and help us. And if we're able to do that and uh, keep ourselves as healthy as possible in the meantime, we will have more tools over time to be able to fight uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharfstein. Uh, Dr. Ava Powell, if you would offer some opening remarks, and thank you for all that you're doing to put information out in the hands of Delawareans. Uh, thank you, Dr. Walker. Um, I'm very privileged and honored to be able to share with you the work that we are doing uh, with My Healthy Community and the work that we have done to try to share as much data as we can with the public and Delawareans so that they can best inform um, their daily activities based on the COVID pandemic. Um, like Dr. Sharfstein mentioned and Dr. Walker mentioned the importance of social distancing. Uh, we can see in our numbers and the data that um, you know, we're trying to do our best to make sure that we can distance ourselves from other people, reduce transmission and the spread of the virus in the community. This is a great tool. Uh, we launched this back in May of 2019, the original version, the COVID-19 tracker, where we have more specific data on COVID-19 is now live. Um, it's at myhealthycommunity.dhss.delaware.gov. As you go through this website, it's a, it's a great opportunity to look at the current information that's being released on a daily basis. So I wanted to share everybody an overview. This section here provides you with the number of deaths that we have, the rate of deaths per 10,000 people. We also can see the number of positive cases that we have in the state of Delaware, and then also that rate per 10,000 people. Then we can also look at what's going on at a county level. So here, as you can see that there is hyperlinks where if you click on these, it will take you to the specific county, and then you'll get county-specific data. We also have the numbers here just as a quick overview, and then you can see the rate as well. 
We have the current number of hospitalizations for the state, as well as the number of people who've recovered, and Dr. Walker went over those numbers with us earlier, and those that have tested negative. We also have here a map, and you can zoom in here and see better where, where the highest rates of cases are occurring. So it basically adjusts for, for the population. So instead of seeing a heat map where we would see um, the largest numbers because there are a large number of people that live there, we're actually seeing these numbers per population. And that helps us to know where the highest rates of cases are actually occurring. And you can hover over the zip code and actually see that rate per 10,000 people. Then I wanna scroll down a little bit farther into our data dashboard. We have a number of different graphs that, that share data about the COVID outbreak pandemic. What you can see is we have 14, bar day, or 14 day bar charts, but we can also look at 13 day. And if you prefer to see a line graph, you can also do that as well. We put trend lines with the data so that we can see whether or not the trend is increasing or decreasing. And you can see that here for new hospitalizations, we're seeing a trend that's decreasing. We also can share and release the information about the percent of people who've tested positive. And as you hover over the bar graphs, you can see what that actual percentage is over time. We also have emergency department data, and we look at that for influenza-like illness, which we do every flu season. We're also looking at that at COVID-like illness. Uh, very similar types of syndromes, but you know there are some nuances there. It looks at diagnosis codes that are being, um, you know, in the ED emergency departments, and so we are having better sense of where we have our COVID-like illness, um, which is in the blue. You can see that that's increasing, and our flu-like illness is is decreasing. And those um, percentages are actually presented here. We also have information on the personal protective equipment and our inventory status um, from a two-week interval where we have one to two weeks or we are at a critical uh, level. We have information on our mitigation strategies, so where we declared the state of emergency, the governor did, on March 12th. Um, we have information and details for those, so you can click on those and take you to the actual announcement. And then the most recent one of requiring cloth face coverings in public and businesses that happened within the past week or two. We also have information on total tests and testing as a whole. And so this shows us both positives and negatives together. Again, we have our county specific and you can look in and zoom into the different um, zip codes. One of the things as we scroll down, we have information by race and ethnicity like Dr. Walker mentioned, and we can see the, the rates per 10,000 population and how those affect different racial groups. And then I'll scroll down here. Uh, we actually have more information on race below for our, our positive cases. And then this is uh, basically a, a movie or a overview from time lapse where you can see the increasing number of cases in specific geographies across the state. Um, and a lots of different graphs here. So um, I wanted to point out too, we have age specific data as well. We have counts, but we also have those as rates below. We have cases by uh, sex, so males and females, and we have percentage of those cases. So you can see that. One of the really key important things that I wanna take everybody to, um, not to spend too much time on the, the statewide, but we also have the ability to search for smaller geographies. And I think that's really the key of My Healthy Community, is we can see at a community level what's going on in our neighborhood. And so I'm just gonna quickly scroll to the very top because there are two different places that you can actually search for community level data. So at this very, very top here, there's a search bar and I can type in my address or I can actually go to jump to a location. And this one's nice because it shows a list of the locations that I can recently, I've recently searched, or I can actually search by county, cities, zip codes, state senate districts, state house districts, census tracts, neighborhoods, and census block groups. So I will just take you quickly, actually I wanna, I'm gonna type in an address here so you can see that this is possible, so 546, South Bedford, which is the location of our state service center. And that will actually pop up where this actual um, address is located in the block group. So I can click on that 
and it will take me to the actual location. You can see here, it's in Georgetown. And what you'll also notice, like Dr. Walker mentioned, is we are a small state and we have very small populations in specific areas. So likely with the census block group, we may not have information available at that specific level. But you can see that um, the, the state level data would be uh, presented below. But then I can also see that there's a census tract. So my census block group falls in a census tract. So there might be more information available at the census tract. And you can see it zooms out to the specific area. We're still in Georgetown. And so for, for this census tract, I can see that there were 193 positive cases. There were 225 that tested negative and 38 individuals actually recovered. And again, we can have other ways to get back to higher geographies. But um, I also wanted to share with you, if you scroll down, we can still see some additional information on the testing and information when it's, po when it's available. For, for example, here, and it's, I'm trying to see if you can see this, but the census tract here you can see for non-Hispanic whites, we have rates that are available to present, and then also we have an unknown category of race. But I like to emphasize that when available, our data, when data are available at a smaller geography, we are making every effort to release those data to you so you can have that information about your community. And if you want more information, and this to just to end this section of, of our, our session today, I do want to share with you that if you want to know more about your census tract, uh, so you can click on the Looking for General Health Information. It does take us out of the coronavirus web, website, the COVID tracker, but it tells me how many people live in the census tract, what the population density is, what is the racial distribution and the age distribution. It has a lot of census um, demographics on this website, and it has all of our other health concerns here, environmental chronic diseases. And when you want to go back to the COVID-19 dashboard, you can quickly jump back to that dashboard. It takes you back to the information on the census tract, and then you can explore some more. So Dr. Walker, I will hand it back over to you and thank everybody for taking the time to walk through My Healthy Community with me. Thank you so much for walking us through that. We have several questions that have come in that we can respond to. And the first one is a question from Gary Persinger, the mayor of Dewey Beach. He's asking, the cases on the data on new cases reported each day on the dashboard do not match some of the data reported on the My Healthy Community website. Notably, the difference between data points on the cumulative case graphs versus the daily reported totals. And he goes on to say that he's trying to reproduce the information around the five-day moving trend and other information, but would be interested in knowing whether some of the data is available to download so that he can understand and explore the data himself. He's an elected official and has a background in statistics and wants to know that he can reproduce some of those trends um, and, and especially inform his own uh, local and, and understand the state decision-making. Tabitha, I don't know if you could start with that one, and uh, it may be easier to demonstrate it or or to um, to just answer in um, in the usual way. So one thing I would say is that because we are providing daily data, that opens up the opportunity for us for um, when we are working to resolve some of those missing data values that we receive. So when we get the data in, into us through electronic lab reporting, we basically take that information and, you know, sometimes we're missing some of the, the county information, sometimes we're missing race information, and sometimes we have to go back and look to make sure that we can fill in that missing information. There are times when we have, so that can, that can explain some differences when we're seeing numbers change in different uh, groupings, so like stratifications like age or race. For the cumulative number, there are changes in those numbers because there are times when when we're dealing dealing with daily data and we're we're presenting that on a daily basis. That when we do release those, we find sometimes duplicates that are in our system. And as we are addressing some of the quality control issues within the data, we want to make sure that we have the most accurate information in there. So sometimes two lab results can be in the system for the same person, and we call that deduping or deduplicating that information. So we're able to resolve those numbers and um, present better information on a daily basis. So we can get more information in a couple of days that can help improve the numbers that we were reporting out previously. 
Thank you so much for the answer. So the, the next question, Dr. Sharfstein, I'll have you take this one. Michelle wants to know more about the measures that Delaware is using to make decisions about reopening. Um, she, she's been listening to a lot of information about uh, metrics from Dr. Burks and Dr. Fauci in federal guidelines and wondered if there was some magical number, if there was a, a metric that we're supposed to be looking at, um, or if that should only be the daily new case numbers and hope that you could uh, respond to that from a, a national perspective and also sure. the guidance that you're giving states across our country. Sure, and first of all, let me just say how impressed I am with the Delaware data dashboard. I haven't seen anything quite so detailed and I, I really like the ability to look at different levels of geography to help people understand what is going on in their area. I think, of course, the big picture is that even if your area is doing a little bit better now, that doesn't really mean it's time to let up because Delaware is one community and people can go from place to place. Um, but it is really helpful to see the trends and to be able to look at how things are shifting across the state. So um, to your question about reopening, um, I think that there are several factors that people are looking at. One of them is the one that you mentioned, which is that the number of cases is going down. Of course, you'd wanna see that the number of new hospitalizations, the number of deaths are also going down, kind of consistent with that. Um, and then there's a, a second um, topic, which is the ability of the healthcare system to withstand the surge of patients. Because as you reopen, you have the risk of more patients uh, getting sick and you don't wanna be caught um, flat-footed with the healthcare system. So there should be adequate space in the healthcare system, you, um, uh, adequate ICU capacity, adequate personal protective equipment um, availability. Um, another uh, requirement uh, for that uh, a number of public health reports have put forward is the public health capacity itself, that there should be um, uh, the ability to respond to cases through contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine. What that does is slows down the ability of the virus to jump from person to person. If you can help someone safely isolate at home, help their contacts safely quarantine, um, or even offer them a hotel room if they can't do it at home, then what you're doing is depriving the virus of a chance to jump from person to person. So having that capability of slowing the spread is like an insurance policy against having to shut everything down again. So that's another really important um, quality. So those, those are some of the most important things, uh, you know, um, uh, resilience in the healthcare system, enough PPE, declining numbers of um, uh, cases, and um, a public health capacity to respond. Those are the kinds of things that uh, many places are looking at as they're making decisions whether to um, uh, open up again. Thank you so much. And, and those are the very measures that we've built into our dashboard. It's easiest to display on My Healthy Community, uh, but that 14-day view is something that we're plotting and tracking. And if uh, you're listening to this video and you want to see any of the presentations from the governor's press briefings, you can see some of those data trends going forward uh, where we've built out not only one measure, but a, a suite of six measures that we will continue to track and, and uh, check on a regular basis. I, uh, the next question, uh, Tavisa, you may want to take this one. Holly wants to know, is there any way to display the ages of those in the hospital and the deaths? Um, because they're hearing so much about the elderly being most at risk. She wanted to know if there was a breakdown available. So not at this moment. We have a break. We don't have a breakout breakdown available. But in you know that that is definitely something that is as an important indicator of who is being hospitalized and, and what age groups are most affected. Um, that is definitely something that we can you know explore further. We do have information on Delaware residents who have been hospitalized um, in our own surveillance system, and that's usually what we are tracking. Currently available on our website are hospitalizations for anyone who is hospitalized in Delaware. Thank you so much. Um, there are many questions about what happens when we start to do more testing. How do these trends change? Uh, Dr. Sharstein, I don't know if you could answer this one as you know, states ramp up with their testing capacity, how does that impact our ability to understand trend lines and new cases that we might be finding more and not actually having more uh, cases of COVID-19? Well, that's a, that's a really good point because um, one of the 
generally recommended criteria for opening is adequate testing capacity um, because you want to be able to catch things early um, and not have to rely on a surge of patients to figure out that things are out of hand. Um, it can be a little bit complicated. I think one of the things to do is you look at your overall number of tests, but that's not the only thing. You also want to look at the issue that, that you're talking about earlier, Kara, the percentage of them that were positive. And so the fact that you're seeing a um, you know, relatively stable number of tests, I understand, but a declining positive is generally a good, de declining percentage of them that are positive is good. And in general, um, people have said, that they'd like to see that percentage down below 12%. So you're headed in that direction right now in Delaware, which is, which is excellent. The other way to think about testing is to think about are priority populations able to get tested? So that includes people in long-term care facilities or assisted living. Is there enough testing to be able to really do a good outbreak response? Um, same for shelters, for people experiencing homelessness or jails. These are areas where you could have huge outbreaks. Um, and it's very important to have adequate testing to be able to come in and, and close down the outbreak as quickly as possible. Uh, so I think that um, you know the ability to get tested, that the last one would obviously be if people have symptoms, are they able to get a test quickly? And can that feed into a system of tracking the contacts? Um, so we wanna think about testing, not just the overall number, and then secondarily, not just the percent positive, but is testing really linked to the response? Because the, the, the last point I will make is that um, testing alone just helps us understand where the virus is. It turns on the lights a little bit, but testing doesn't actually control the spread of the disease. Just control the spread of the disease, you have to do something. You have to shut down the outbreak. You have to help somebody isolate. You have to find their contacts. So I think the right way to think about testing is as part of a system of control and suppression of the virus. And I know that you've gone a long way in building that system here in Delaware. Thank you so much. So this, um, this feeds into the next question very nicely because we've been working very hard on displaying data that's useful and current and updated. And there was a question that came in about why has the state changed the way we've reported the numbers? And are we somehow manipulating them in a way that is, is inconsistent with what other states are doing? And Tabitha, maybe you can take that one. So I would say that because we're dealing with daily data, um, we typically report data out likely at an annual perspective. And so what we're, you know, what we're trying to best do is get the most accurate information out to the public so that we can make those decisions about um, how to move forward. So I would say that as you, you see those numbers changing because we are doing the best that we can to make sure that we don't have duplicates, we have the information that we have that, that we need for each case when we contact each person who is positive, um, that we can most accurately describe once we have updated data. So for an example, um, when we get emergency department data in, those messages can be updated up to 30 days after we get those messages. So we're getting more complete data, but it may be a little bit later. And so we're trying to do the best that we can to give the most accurate information. And sometimes that results in us updating numbers that we had reported previously. Thank you so much. Um, and But that does mean we're adding them as soon as we have them. And it's not necessarily in real time, but we are updating our information as quickly as possible. Um, thank you for answering that question. Uh, I th think the final question, um, I'll, I'll pitch over to you again, Dr. Sharfstein. What do you think is the single most important data points that Delawareans and Americans should look at? And, and I think connected to that is, is there one model that is predicting what the summer will look like? Great. Um, the truth is there's not one data point. And that's what I like so much about your dashboard because it allows people to see different things. You could say the number of tests, but that's not quite enough. You could say the percent positive, but that depends on the number of tests. You certainly want to keep your eye on hospitalizations and, of course, deaths. So it's really a bit of a picture, and your data allows people to see that picture. What I like to think of in public health is, let's look at a, a problem from a few different angles, and let's see whether we can um, see some consistencies. If you see the number of new cases, 
and diagnoses going down, hospitalizations going down, deaths going down, the percentage positive going down. You're looking at it from different angles and you're getting the picture. That's what people should be doing rather than focusing, I think, too much on one particular number and ignoring all the rest. So I think you're doing a fantastic job giving people the tools to do that themselves. And as uh, you are able to put up other data, I think particularly about things like contact tracing or other kinds of response efforts, you'll really have an even fuller picture about how different aspects of the uh, response are going. So I think you're, you're doing great. I have not seen another state with that kind of great data. Um, and I, I think it's gonna be super helpful. But going back to, to, to the second question, well, what's gonna happen this summer? You know, I wish uh, we had a crystal ball to be able to tell us that. And you can read a lot of models, but you don't know whether they're gonna be accurate. The models are all based on different assumptions. And one of those models might be based on the assumption that we're all very careful that we still stay um, are, you know, at least six feet away, that we wear masks when we're out with people, that um, we wash our hands significantly, uh, way more than we ever thought we could do, you know, and that we continue to be uh, very wary of what is a contagious and lethal virus. Those models show a reduction in cases and the ability to open our economy more. On the other hand, there are models that, that, that say, well, what if that doesn't happen? What if people say, you know, we're past the worst of it, we can go back to our lives before, and they, they go to you know, big parties, and they don't wear masks, and they you know, bunch up together. Those models show a lot of virus. You know, the virus isn't listening to this uh, webcast. The virus isn't paying attention to all the daily headlines about you know, what people are saying. The virus doesn't even care about the models about the virus. The virus is just looking for ways to go from person to person. And if we wind up giving the virus a lot of opportunity, the virus will take it. And the result will be more cases. And you can see that in different parts of the United States now. Cases are rising in many parts of the United States. And the question for Delaware will be, well, is Delaware going to be on that list? And you know, I think um, that is really going to be up to the people in Delaware and the businesses in Delaware. And uh, I think you are doing a great job uh, in your leadership and giving people the tools to make uh, the decisions in their own lives that will keep themselves and their families and their neighborhoods safe. Thank you so much. And thank you both for joining me today. I wanna to thank our ASL interpreter for helping us communicate this information. And just a final word, uh, remember if you do have symptoms of COVID-19, please call your doctor about a referral for testing. And if you don't have a doctor, you can get an order through dialing 211. If you need social services assistance, including food access, housing, transportation, or getting items delivered to your home, please call Delaware 211, we can help you. For the latest statistics on COVID-19 in Delaware, go to de.gov backslash coronavirus or Google My Healthy Community and bookmark our site so that you can see when data is updated and more available at the local level. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please be safe and be well and continue to send us your questions.